Hello, and welcome to the Southern Hotel's first quarter 2020 earnings conference call webcast. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please speak to a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note, today's event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Max Sims. Mr. Sims, please go ahead. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. If you did not receive a copy of the earnings release, you may access it on our website at southerlyhotels.com. In the release, the company has reconciled all non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measure in accordance with Reg G requirements. Any statements made during this conference call, which are not historical, may constitute forward-looking statements. Although we believe the expectations reflected in any forward-looking statements are based on reasonable assumptions, we can give no assurance that these expectations will be attained. Factors and risks that can cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by forward-looking statements are detailed in today's press release and from time to time in the company's filings with the SEC. The company does not undertake a duty to update or revise any forward-looking statements. With that, I'll turn the call over to Scott. Thanks, Mac. Good morning, everyone. Heading into 2020, we believe the company is well positioned for a great year. We had a solid balance sheet, our asset condition was the best it has ever been, and we had a renewed managerial focus on executing our strategy. This belief proved true with commendable RevPAR growth in January and February. Excluding the Georgian terrorists due to the 2019 Super Bowl comp, our portfolio experienced RevPAR increases in January and February of 5.8% and 4.3% respectively. Compare this to the total U.S. lodging market RevPAR increases of 2.2% in January and 1.7% in February. That's a sizable outperformance for our portfolio. Unfortunately, as we all know, that is when the world was changed by the COVID-19 pandemic. As the concerns surrounding the pandemic escalated, U.S. hotels experienced unprecedented declines in top-line performance in March, with RevPAR dropping 51.9% from the same month last year. Despite our strong start to the quarter, all of Sudley's markets finished the quarter with rev par declines. Characterized by the unprecedented events surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, we believe the first quarter of this year will shape the future of the lodging, lodging industry for some time. The impact was immediately felt across all sectors of the economy as government-mandated closures of non-essential businesses and social distancing requirements took place. Furthermore, state and local government issued travel restrictions in early March sent shockwaves through the lodging industry resulting in a rapid increase in group and transient cancellations and sharp revenue declines. As the situation unfolded, Sudley's leadership team recognized that, due to the speed and severity of the pandemic's impact, swift action was required. Sudley's action plan to limit the, this impact to operations and preserve long-term value for our shareholders consisted of several key objectives. The company gave first priority to the safety of its staff and guests by implementing a number of standard operating procedures at its properties in order to maintain an elevated level of sanitization. Second, the company focused on mitigating the pandemic's financial impact by quickly implementing stringent property and corporate level cost reduction initiatives. At the property level, the company's relationship with its dedicated manager, Our Town Hospitality, enabled the swift rollout of a retrenchment plan. Action items include the closure of food and beverage outlets and other non-essential guest amenities in order to shrink the cost structure of the properties, the downsizing of staffing levels and benefits, including the layoff of 90% of hotel staff with reductions in salary for staff not subject to layoff, and the deferral of all non-essential capital expenditures. The company also worked with its management partners to seek out alternative sources of revenue and renegotiate all service and vendor contracts. At the corporate level, the company implemented several cost containment initiatives, which include the layoff of over 20% of staff, a reduction in salaries and benefits for all remaining staff, and the waiving of quarterly director's fees by the company's board of directors. In addition, common dividends have been suspended and preferred dividends have been deferred. The company also has undertaken balance sheet strengthening initiatives to mitigate the financial impact of COVID-19. At the onset of the pandemic, the company immediately reached out <clears throat> to its lenders to begin discussing forbearance agreements for each of its mortgage loans. To date, the company has been successful in completing a variety of modifications with the majority of its lenders, which provided immediate financial relief. The belief that we believe modifications for the remaining mortgage loans are near completion. 
Additionally, the company is pursuing all applicable federally funded assistance programs under the CARES Act and thus far has received proceeds from three separate applications for the Paycheck Protection Program. Lastly, while the pandemic has depressed the economy and lodging industry, the changing macro environment has presented challenges as well as opportunities for the company. Later in the call, our CEO, Dave Folsom, will discuss the evolving landscape of the industry and Southerly's strategy to adapt and capitalize on these opportunities. I will now turn the call over to Tony. Thank you, Scott. Reviewing performance for the period ended March 31st. Total revenue for the quarter was approximately $37.2 million, representing a decrease of approximately $10.2 million, or 21.5% over the same quarter a year ago. Hotel EBITDA for the quarter was approximately $5.1 million, representing a decrease of $8.1 million, or 61.6% over the same quarter a year ago. And adjusted FFO for the quarter was a deficit of approximately $3.6 million, a decrease of $8.4 million over the prior year, or 175%. The company had total cash of approximately $22.1 million, consisting of unrestricted cash and cash equivalents of approximately $14.7 million, as well as approximately $7.4 million, which was reserved for real estate taxes, capital improvements, and certain other expenses. At the end of the quarter, we had principal balances of approximately $359.6 million in outstanding debt at a weighted average interest rate of 4.78%. Approximately 86% of the company's debt carried a fixed rate of interest. During the quarter, <clears throat> we took a valuation allowance against the deferred tax asset, resulting in a tax charge of approximately $5.5 million. As Scott mentioned, with the onset of the pandemic, we reacted swiftly in coordination with our management companies to reduce hotel operating expenses and mitigate the impact of the loss of business. Although we reduced hotel operating expenses by approximately 70%, we estimate loss of revenue will exceed operating income in the range of $1.6 million to $2 million per month for the second quarter. We expect increases in customer traffic and continued cost containment to ease those burn rates as we move into the thir third quarter, as we have seen occupancy rates move from the single digits in April to low double digits in May and June. We also have had to put a hold on all capital projects and anticipate the capital expenditures for the remainder of the year will only relate to the replacement of critical systems reaching the end of their useful life. We estimate total capital expenditures will amount to approximately $3.6 million for calendar tw year 2020. Most of those projects were completed or well underway at the onset of the pandemic. At the corporate level, we reduced expenses by approximately 25% to a range of $1.15 to $1.25 million per quarter. The savings is the result, mostly the result of reductions in regular compensation, anticipated bonuses and benefits for members of the board, the company's executive officers and employees, as well as elimination of most discretionary expenses. In March, we announced a suspension of our dividend and a deferral of payment of dividends announced in January. The suspension and deferral eliminates a draw on the company's cash reserves of approximately four and a quarter million dollars per quarter. With the onset of the pandemic, we were early to begin discussions with our lenders regarding forbearance of current payments of principal and interest required under our loans. While no interest has been forgiven, we estimate existing and contemplated agreements will allow us to defer current payments of approximately $4.9 million payable during the second quarter 2020 and payments ranging from $3.2 million to $4.1 million payable during the third quarter 2020. While some deferrals are required to be repaid or caught up in subsequent quarters, most of the deferrals will be repaid upon maturity of the loans. The company has also been in discussion with its lenders regarding anticipated noncompliance with the financial covenants under the agreements that contain them. Based on these discussions, the company anticipates waivers from its lenders under agreements that articulate noncompliance as an event of default. During the second quarter, the company made applications through its banks under the SBA's Paytech Protection Program and received proceeds of approximately $10.7 million. Pursuant to the terms of the CARES Act, the proceeds of each PPP loan will be used for payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, or utility costs. 
Recent changes to regulations regarding loan forgiveness provide for the extension of the covered period to 24 weeks, and it lowered the amount of proceeds that must be spent on payroll and related costs to 60% of loan proceeds. Additionally, the repayment period for the portion of the loan that is not forgiven has been extended from 18 months to five years, with repayment beginning no later than 10 months after the loan origination date. The company anticipates a significant portion of the loan to qualify for loan forgiveness. And I will now turn the call over to Dave. Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everyone. I would like to start off by extending our thoughts and prayers to those that have been affected by the ongoing pandemic, as well as our appreciation to healthcare workers and first responders for their valuable efforts. Our efforts to preserve our business and ensure its future success have required us to make difficult decisions in the, in the past 90 days. As demand evaporated due to the virus spread, operating expenses were curtailed, capital improvements suspended, and extensive employee reductions were made. Our hotels have remained technically open during the pandemic, albeit with only a small cadre of key personnel that are needed to service minimal occupancy, but whose presence is necessary to ensure a smooth transition during the recovery. As a hospitality company whose staff is at the heart of our business, it has been difficult to say the least to make these decisions, especially with respect to our valued associates. We look forward to welcoming back both our loyal staff and guests to our portfolio of hotels in the near future. Despite COVID-19's negative impact on the lodging industry and the larger macroeconomic environment, we remain confident that travel demand will return. However, the recovery will undoubtedly be shaped by the virus and the government's response to it, along with the industry's ability to adjust to changing consumer preferences. Our partnership with our dedicated manager, Our Town Hospitality, facilitated the company's efficient and swift response to the unfolding crisis at the end of the first quarter. To adapt and ensure future success for the company, we believe it is important to consider a few key factors that will shape the hotel industry's recovery. First, the trajectory of the virus itself remains unknown due to inconsistent reopenings among jurisdictions and the uncertainty of the containment of the virus. Therefore, the company must be prepared to optimize its cost strategies based on changing scenarios. Staffing protocols for various levels of occupancy will help manage variable costs and ensure maximum property level efficiency and profitability. Second, we believe this uncertainty will be reflected in muted lodging demand in the near term. As a result, the company must continue to creatively seek alternative sources of business until travel demand normalizes. Last, the pandemic's impact on traveler behavior and preferences will likely shape the lodging industry's service and cleanliness standards for years to come. As a result, every property in our portfolio has adopted extensive hygiene protocols. Hilton's clean stay, and our own SoClean programs, which encompass changes to service standards at every level of the guest experience, have been implemented at our properties. The company will continue to monitor changing consumer preferences and implement changes that fit our long-term strategy. While we believe corporate and, inter and international travel will continue to lag, we're starting to experience some positive momentum as an industry and as a company. Smith Travel and TSA Checkpoint data continue to trend positively, underscoring a definite improvement in consumer confidence among travelers. The transient leisure segment has seen a material improvement in recent weeks, benefiting our coastal and drive to leisure, leisure locations. In general, we agree with the growing consensus that transient leisure business will be the quickest segment to recover. Overall, we believe our portfolio's concentration of drive to leisure destinations as well as its relatively minor exposure to global gateway markets will lead to a stronger recovery and outperformance over our peers. And with that, we'll now open the call up for questions. Yes, thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble the roster. And the first question comes from Tyler Battery with uh, Jenny Capital Markets. 
Uh, hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. <clears throat> Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, your first one for, for me, uh, you know, can you uh, give any more color in terms of, uh, you know, occupancy trends in your portfolio, <clears throat> you know, in, in, in May and June? And you, know, you mentioned uh, some improvements on the, the drive to leisure. You know, any any data points you can share in terms of, you know, what you're seeing on the ground at some of these beach or more leisure-focused assets in terms of uh, trends getting a little bit better? Yeah, um, generally speaking, in a lot of these markets, at the depth of this problem, you know, we saw single-digit occupancies, and that was really a function, or less. I mean, some we had no occupancy for a while, and that was a function, Tyler, of a lot of the uh, government restrictions for non-essential Guests. I mean, in some of our hotels, we, we were not even allowed to have any guests at all unless they were an essential health care or government worker. That, that's that been changed at most of our locations. So what we've seen, I'd say, over the past several weeks is a change from you know low single-digit occupancies to uh, teens, very low teens, uh, and that's growing. Some of our markets are still uh, essentially locked down. Uh, the city of Atlanta is a good ex- example of that, uh, but we're seeing a lot of leisure bookings in the second half of the year, including a resumption of some of the leisure group bookings, which we haven't seen in a while. And I think uh, a couple of our hotels are actually seeing some uh, meeting room space being booked for reservations, uh, which is a good trend. So, um, I mean, there, there's a lot of data we could provide you, uh, and you could talk to Scott after the call, but. Generally, we're, we're, we're not seeing a return to 50, 60, 80 percent occupants anytime soon, but we are seeing a pickup. Okay, okay. And just, um, are you seeing any corporate travel at all at your at your properties, or, or is that basically a, a, a zero at this point? Yeah. Hey. Good morning, Tyler. It's Scott. I, I mean, I'd, it's not zero, but it, it is it is very very muted. I mean, our, our the large corporate clients. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Nestle and, and you know, in Northern Virginia, it's a huge client, or you know, IBM. I mean, any any of the large typical corporate clients that we have, you know, normal throughput for, they're not traveling yet. You're seeing individual business traveler kind of on their own, smaller smaller shops um, starting to, to travel a little bit during the weekday, but it's it's very muted right now. Okay, okay. Um, and then any thoughts in terms of uh, you know, break even occupancy levels at, at some of your properties. I mean, I imagine maybe it's different by property type or, or location, but um, just kind of trying to get a sense of at the property level, you know, what what sort of occupancy you need to see to uh, be profitable. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's difficult just to look at it on an occupancy basis, obviously, because you know, if you look at a, a lower rev, uh, lower ADR hotel, you know, it's, it's tougher to flow through and, and cover expenses. So, you know, generally speaking, I think we're looking at around a $30 rev par, you know, should cover property level expenses before ownership costs. But that's, you know, that's just a, a back of the envelope, you know, ballpark across the board. It's obviously a case by case basis, as you well know. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. And then switching gears a little bit, you know, you've gotten some forbearance. Um, just uh, how have the conversations gone? With your with your lenders, um, you know the conversations and the tone of those conversations maybe changed um, more more recently, or or uh, just trying to get a sense of of how some of those discussions are are progressing. Sure, uh, yeah, as you know, we got a, a whole mix of of mortgage lenders from from small balance sheets to big balance sheet banks to life companies to CMBS. Um, typically speaking, we've seen the balance sheet you know banking relationships hold firm and, and be, you know, more than understanding and willing to work with us um, from the very beginning. You know, we, we were probably out ahead of this, you know, than, than most. I mean, I think we had all of, all of our lender calls on, on May or March 17th, you know, one right after another to, to start explaining the situation. So everybody's been appreciative of the communication and, and been, for the most part, more than willing to work with us and, and try to figure out some solutions for us. The CMBS world is, is a little different, as I'm sure has you know been well documented, um, both you know just in the, in the industry publications as well as kind of at the, the government level, um, you know looking for some government intervention. The CMBS structure is just not really set up to manage through uh, a pandemic like this. So, 
we are starting to see some uh, progress with them. Um, it, it's been, you know, an open dialogue, but just to date not, uh, you know, overly productive. But I think we are getting to a point where there will be some, you know, some productive uh, solutions worked out with them. Okay, and just following up on that, this is more of an <clears throat> open-ended question, but, you know, how are you thinking about um, your liquidity right now? I mean, you know, you provided some data in terms of the, the cash burn and whatnot, but I'm um, just kind of curious, uh, you know, how you're thinking about the potential options that might be out there uh, over the next couple of months. Yeah, I mean, the thing to, to remember about the, the liquidity and the cash burn is that it, 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 it is – reducing that the burn rate is reducing as demand recovers now depending on the pace of the recovery and the pace of demand resumption uh, it's difficult to forecast when that burn rate basically stops that was i think the part of your break-even question but uh you know the way we view it is we we have been active across the board in looking for liquidity sources and capital uh, for the company since this began, both in the public domain, the private domain, and from the government. And we continue to do that weekly in looking for the most advantageous uh, capital solution for the company. I mean, as, as I mentioned in my remarks, we, we're confident hotel demand is going to return, uh, but we want to underscore the fact that, uh, you know, liquidity is, is essential for for any hotel company survival, and we've been active with all of our counterparties in, in, in trying to access that capital. And as Tony mentioned in his remarks, we were able to do that uh, a couple, about a month and a half ago uh, with the Paycheck Program, and we're continuing to look for all opportunities to bring in the correct form and amount of capital for the company. Okay, and just the last question for me, uh, you know, at some point in the in the future, you know, the the, the COVID disruption <clears throat> is going to be behind us. You know, what sort of tailwinds uh, do you think might come from this that may benefit you specifically? And you know, when you look at the operations at your hotels, do you think it's possible that your properties in the future after the pandemic, you know, that maybe that the margin structure is perhaps higher or maybe the flow through is, is, is more attractive uh, after we move through this or, or you know, you kind of well, expecting things to, to be roughly the same? Your, your question is right on the mark. I mean, we have essentially, as, as Scott mentioned and, and Tony, that, you know, we have, we have laid off, unfortunately, you know, 90, 95 percent of our staff at the hotels. And this gives us the opportunity in conjunction with our new management company, to essentially restructure the operations and costs at any given hotel. So when we, when we emerge for the, from this, we think across all departments and all of our undistributed expenses, we're going to be able to reorganize all of these hotels for the future. And we think there is margin, on an apples to apples comparison, we think there is margin pickup. Sales and marketing efforts, uh, even though we have new uh, sanitation and hygiene protocols, we think there's an opportunity to perhaps, uh, you know, pick up some margins on that front. But but your your question is well founded. We think there is some some opportunity on that side. And anecdotally, I can tell you that from the field, uh, our managers are telling us there's a pent up demand for leisure to, for leisure travel. People want to get out of their house. They want to get out of the lockdowns, and they want to travel. And we're seeing a lot of pickup in the second half of the year for leisure demand, leisure group. Uh, whether that remains, whether it gets canceled, we don't know yet. But we think there is a, a tailwind, to use your words, that uh, we think we can realize uh, as, this, as the pandemic abates and we put this behind us, that, that there's going to be an eagerness for people to get out and travel. Tony, did you have any? I, I would only add that I think in the short term, uh, I think we're going to see some pickup with uh, certain segments of the labor market are not going to be as strong and tight as they were uh, before the pandemic. Uh, I know we had several markets where uh, the demand for housekeepers was extraordinary and we were having to pay uh, extremely high rates to keep uh, housekeepers in our hotels. 
Uh, and I expect that in the short term that we won't be experiencing the same kind of tightness in the labor market. Okay. That, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Daniel Santos with Piper Jaffray. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I mean, just kind of going off of uh, the question uh, before me, I mean, can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about how you envision the hotels will, will sort of run differently in this sort of post-COVID um, cleaner environment. Um, what does that look like? And, and obviously, you know, this might change what maximum occupancy in your hotels uh, could be. And so could you give us a sense of what you, how you think this might impact your occupancy, you know, once things do start to open up? Well, I don't think the cost restructuring or the restructuring of the organization necessarily will impact the occupancy. I, I just think it's a function of how we're going to run the hotels, and it's it's really a function of from every every guest point of service that you may have, from the front door to the front desk, to uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the housekeeping, to food and beverage. I mean, there's a host of things that will change going forward. Some of these will just be mandated by the brand. Some will be internally generated. Some of them will be government focused. Uh, I can tell you, for instance, uh, on a housekeeping level, you may think that all this extra, you know, extra hygiene protocol work uh, might add cost. But what the industry is seeing is that if you're there for a two or three night stay, you will check into a room and it will have a seal on it that will certify that it's been appropriately dis disinfected, but you're not going to receive the same daily housekeeping uh, service that you used to receive, mainly because guests do not want strangers or housekeepers inside the room that they're staying in that could potentially infect them. So you're not going to have the daily thorough housekeeping cleaning protocols that you used to see, and then when the guest checks out after a two or three day stay, you have a, a far lengthier cleaning and disinfecting routine for that room, and it is prepared for a new guest. At the end, that's probably a, 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 a pickup in terms of margin for us as the owner. That's an example. Um, and there are a host of other things on the food and beverage side. Uh, I think you're going to see a different way to do uh, in-room food and beverage. What we're doing right now is for those areas where you have a continued food and beverage service, the guest orders, and then the guest comes down and gets uh, uh, their their food and beverage not delivered to them, but they actually go and pick it up and take it back to their room. So it's a different cost structure to do that than it is the uh, the old way where you have a uniform member of the hotel staff deliver uh, a in-room food and beverage uh, to the 40th floor of a tower. Got it. That's helpful. And then I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some, you know, maybe alternative demand drivers. I mean, you're hearing of, you know, some hotels and markets that are close to universities uh, being used for students. Are you seeing any opportunities like that at any of your assets? We have, and we've been, frankly, uh, looking at each one individually. To your point, though, there have been health care, hospital uh, uh, room night programs, there have been universities who are uh, attempting to rent rooms on a long-term basis for dormitory stays for students, um, uh, you know, essential worker, FEMA, government. There, we've seen a lot of that alternative work. We, we've taken some of it. Uh, we're not too pleased with the, the idea of turning our hotel or half our hotel into a dorm room. We think that's not a good use, nor is it going to be profitable in the long run, so we've resisted uh, 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 overtures from universities to do that, and, and frankly, I don't think the brands would allow it for those hotels that are uh, formally flagged with a, a you know, a national franchise, um, but we, we've seen different opportunities. We've been very selective in how we take them, and uh, uh, I think that's that's probably the best way to answer that question. Got it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Chris Reynolds with Newberger. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, can you just comment generally about your properties in, in Florida as well as the uh, the Hyde Resorts and 
I think there's some condos associated with that. Maybe just start there and and, and update uh, the activity at that property. Um, yeah, we have uh, several assets in Florida. We've got the, the Double Tree in Jacksonville. Uh, we've got the uh, Tapestry uh, Hotel Alba in Tampa, and then we have a a uh, complex of three assets in Florida in in the Hollywood market. It's a Double Tree flanked by two condo hotels that carry the Hyde uh, Hyde brand. It's not really a brand like you would think of it with Hilton, but the Hyde moniker, uh, and the Hyde Resort, and the Hyde Beach House. Those are our five assets in Florida. Um, you know, those two, those the two condo hotels, we did technically close during the pandemic, and they've been recently reopened as the state and local officials have allowed for the resumption of travel. So those are those were closed, and now they've been reopened, and we're restaffing and, and ramping up the the the, uh, the operations there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And as there are no more questions at the present time, I would like to return to Florida management for any closing comments. No, thank you very much for the call. Um, appreciate it, and I hope everyone remains safe. Thank you. This concludes today's teleconference. Thank you for attending today's presentation. We now disconnect your lines.